is not really on the Cowlitz Trail itself. We're going to start over at the Washington State Archives because that's where this whole project started, as Roger mentioned earlier, and we got a lot of good information there. So I guess we're off to the archives. We'll see what we can find for your research activities. This is the actual real Constitution of the State of Washington. Yes, this is the 1857 territorial map. Let's start out by telling you about the Cowlitz and where we lived. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Greg. Welcome morning. to Fort Vancouver National Historic Site, the premier historical archaeology site in the Pacific Northwest. This is called a cone mandrel, and it's used for making circles. If you need now, not only did the chief factors and their families live in this house, but everyone who lived inside the fort walls ate their meals in this house. So this is what the Hudson's Bay Company is all about: the fur trade. This is the Indian trade shop. So this is where the Native Americans would come buy goods from the Hudson's Bay Company. And it is a trade shop. Every reconstructed building here has had archaeology done on it. And before the reconstruction occurs, we do the excavation so we can learn as much as we can about that structure and what went on in there. Great. <laughs> well, this has really been interesting, but I suppose we should probably carry on with what we've got to do today. Yes, uh, I'm Dr. John McLaughlin, and I'm awaiting the arrival of one Michael T. Simmons, and we will have some things to talk uh, about, and we are uh, very anxious for his journey to the direction of Fort Nisqually. I know that I've talked to Dr. Tolney there about him, and he can get established there on Puget Sound. Son, you help your mom pack up that wagon now. I'll be out there to hitch up them oxen before you know it. Well, hello there. Aren't you a sight? You must have just arrived here at the fort. Must have been a very long and hard journey on the trail for you. Uh, no, no, uh, Dr. McLaughlin's in charge here. He's the uh, chief factor, as they call him. You may have seen that flag outside there, that big red flag flying up there with those letters HBC. He works for the Hudson's Bay Company. They got a fine sale shop over here. You can buy all the goods and supplies you might ever need. That's right, to establish yourself here in the Oregon country. And Dr. McLaughlin has a fine policy of extending credit to the Americans as well. Oh, uh, my name's Simmons, uh, Michael T. Simmons. Come myself on the Missouri Trail, or I should say from Missouri, on the trail, all the right way here, right to Fort Vancouver. As a matter of fact, you know what? This stool of mine, it made the journey all the way across as well. Matter of fact, my pa made this stool for me when I was but a boy in Kentucky. So it's traveled all the way west right to this place. And it's made a decision, and I think it's a good one to go north up here towards Puget Sound to settle. I'm on my way there today, and I gotta get another sack of flour, I think, at the sales shop. As a matter of fact, just to check out here what time it is, Oh yes, I think that sale shop is going to open up here most directly. Might as well just stay in here, rest a while, as the rain is outside there, and uh, it's a good place to keep dry till it does. Let me tell you about this uh, stool of mine here. I call it my, uh, my thinking stool. You see, when my mind gets all stuck full of thoughts and kind of like water behind a beaver dam, well, all I do is I take this here stool, I set it down, find a nice quiet place, and I just sit on it, and I just think for a while, and before you know it, well, before you know it, my thoughts start flowing like water, like the beaver dam has burst open, and it helps me figure things out, and get a little guidance. Now, the last time I sat on it like that in a real serious way, well, it was back in Missouri. See, the situation there, well, it had kind of developed to the point where things weren't so good, not as good as they used to be. You know, farmer could grow some fine crops there, lots of fine crops as a matter of fact, but you know, they could have what they needed for the family and sell a little bit of it, but there weren't enough people buying it so they could make even more money. 
So that was a bit of a problem. And then there's this uh, man, this uh, friend of mine named Bush, and uh, he, uh, well, he's a good man. He's a good farmer, a good husband, but uh, the color of his skin was giving him some problems, so to speak. There were immigrants coming into Missouri, uh, bringing their slaves, and uh, some of them, well, quite frankly, they just hated black folks. So it was getting to be a dangerous kind of situation there if you were black to be living there in Missouri. So what I did is I took my stool here, put it down, and I started thinking. And before you knew it, I had this idea. You know, Mr. Bush had come to me just before, and he had said that he was going to go west, out to the Oregon country, where well, well, no matter what the color of your skin, a man was free to build a fine farm, a fine home, and a fine life for him and his family. So I go to George and I say, his first name's George, and I say, George, let's go west together. Let's go west together to this Oregon country, this place they call the Garden of Eden. And so George, as prosperous as he was, helped outfit some of the families with goods and supplies and equipment. So. I could make the journey and my family could make the journey with these folks less fortunate than Mr. Bush and myself to outfit their wagons. So we came across the Oregon Trail. I know what you know that's all about, of course, fording rivers and people getting real sick and dying, of course, and going across the plains and the mountains all the way here right to the end. Well, I come out here and you know I had heard that there were some laws that had been passed out here to keep blacks away. As a matter of fact, they were lash laws. And you know, these laws, what they really amounted to was that if you were black and you stayed here too long, they could whip you. They could whip you anywhere from, say, 20 up to 39 times. Feeling this on your back once is not a very pleasant experience, if you know what I mean. So, I knew about that when I came to Fort Vancouver here. What I did is I came right to Dr. McLaughlin and I said, Dr. McLaughlin, sir, I would like to stay here at the fort during this winter. Dr. McLaughlin would have nothing of it because they didn't have any space to see here. So I went about 12 miles east of here at the fort and I found this fine Kanaka. Yes, the Sandwich Islander. And he liked my yellow shirt and he had a fine little hut. So he was willing to trade for that shirt so my family could live in that hut. And I came right back here to Fort Vancouver. I told Dr. McLaughlin I was here and I wanted to earn my way. You see, Dr. McLaughlin has that fine policy of extending credit so Americans can buy goods here at the sales shop. Well, I really wanted to earn my own way and buy my provisions through my work. So Dr. McLaughlin set me to work to saw a number and making shingles, and so I did. And you know, I was thinking, I need to go up north and explore this, uh, this Puget Sound area and see how good it might be to settle and be on the reach of the law for my friend uh, Bush here. So what I did is I get in the canoe here, come spring of uh, 1845, not too long ago, and I, I paddle down the Columbia, and when I get to the mouth of the Cowlitz River, well, oh, there was a lot of spring rains and ice melting and logs coming down, and we just had to come back to the fort. So I really didn't really get to see that, but I've heard there's this trail. It's called the Cowlitz Trail, and if you keep going up there on the Cowlitz River, you come to a place where Mr. Plamondon for the Hudson's Bay Company has a fine farm, Cowlitz Landing they call it, and you can trade your canoes in, so to speak, for horses. And you ride about two or three days north and you come up to Puget Sound. And on the way, apparently, there's a Catholic mission and there's even this, this river I heard about. It's got a series of little falls. I think they call it the Deschutes River. It pours right into Puget Sound. And I got to thinking to myself as well, there must be some fine prairies up there to have farms, and there must be some, well, some fine trees. There's lots of trees around here to cut, make some fine lumber. And you know, I have a grist mill here, or I had one, I should say, in Missouri, and uh, I thought to myself, well, I could build a fine grist mill and grind some of that wheat that those farmers might grow on those prairies. And of course, Puget Sound, the ship captains coming in up there could take away my flour, and you know, there's trees there as well. I could cut that and put it through the sawmill and trade lumber, and I could do this with Fort Nisqually up there as well, another Hudson's Bay post, you know, where I could get goods and supplies in the meantime. As a matter of fact, through Puget Sound, all these goods go all the way up to Fort Victoria on Vancouver Islands, Sandwich Islands, all the way to China. Of course, more likely go to Russian Alaska and down to San Francisco with those ship captains. 
Anyway, as you can see, I've got some pretty big dreams for this area north of here. Well, anyway, it's been nice talking to you folks. I, I do believe the, uh, the sales shop's about to open. And one thing more. I recommend highly that you get yourself or make yourself one of these stools, a thinking stool for yourself, because there's just sure a lot of thinking to be done here in the Oregon country. Well, Dr. McLaughlin, sir, I wanted to thank you very much for your kindness here at Fort Vancouver. As you know, I came here in, uh, well, last winter, of course, asking for a place to live here, and I know you had to turn me away, so uh, I did go out here about 12 miles east, you know, and got that fine hut there. There was a Kanak out there, a Sandwich Islander. I was able to trade my yellow shirt. That's all they wanted for that. My family moved in. Of course, you know the rest of the story, sir. I'd worked so hard here to make those shingles for you and cut that lumber. And today, sir, I'm heading up, heading up north to Puget Sound. Well, we certainly uh, wish you the very best, Mr. Simmons. I do appreciate all the shingles that were made for us. They're good quality. And I have sent word to Dr. Tolmy, and he uh, perhaps will need your assistance up there, and he certainly will extend every good uh, aid to you. I have told him to treat you with uh, respect and with care. So, uh, bon voyage, sir, well, and blessings on you. Well, I appreciate this, sir, especially in light of your policy of not really wanting Americans to be moving north of the Columbia River. Well, I you have proven to be an acceptable American, and so we will uh, cooperate with you as much as possible. Perhaps maybe even an exceptional American, sir, and I hope to prove myself to Dr. Tolmy as well. Well, we'll uh, hear from Dr. Tolmy about that. Well, good so day, we'll sir. we'll need to contact with him. Good day, sir. Yes, sir. Karen, you were talking earlier about how this area, <coughs> being once British, became American. How did that come about? Well, long ago, the Pacific Northwest was really a treasure chest. Uh, at least it was regarded so by the various fur companies. And there were a lot of countries that were interested in this land. It was Great Britain, the US, Spain, France, even Russia. Eventually it boiled down to two countries, US and Great Britain. And through a various uh, number of treaties, the uh, United States government finally got control of what they called the Oregon Territory. But there was still a lot of contention with the Hudson's Bay Company because obviously Britain still wanted some control over the fur trade. And um, the uh, settlers that came up here were causing problems. And we're going to see a little bit of uh, intervention between, those, between some of the settlers. There was a family in particular called Amos and uh, Esther Short who came up and had the, not only the gall to settle north of the Columbia River, which Hudson's Bay Company viewed as its property, but they also had the gall to settle within a stone's throw of Fort Vancouver. So we're gonna go now and see uh, a, a reenactment between Esther Short, who was a very determined and dowdy woman, and uh, Peter Skeen Ogden, who at the time was the chief factor of this Fort Vancouver. Wonderful. Okay, let's go. Okay. Mrs. Short. Mr. Ogden. Oh, Mrs. Short. We've had so much trouble with Mrs. Short around here. She took a claim over on the west side of the fort and she simply will not leave it. Yes, Mrs. Short, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Ogden. So what is troubling you today, ma'am? I've just come out to the garden to take a look at the plants. Well, that is a good idea. I understand that uh, you had a little trouble with our man, Fischette the other day. Yes. He thought he'd come take down my fences again. Oh, really? Yes, I <clears throat> put a stop to that, as you might say. Uh, yes, he told me the story. Oh, Mrs. Short, uh, you have had your troubles here, but mind you, I was never part of it. It was always Douglas that was gave the you trouble. Douglas. Taking us down the river on the boat without an oar. Yes, I thought that was a little much. And over dropping us off in the middle of the winter, over there in Linton, out in our all-togethers, losing our cattle. You know how sick I got, and the children, too? Yes, I understand that. Well, I, as I say, I never did totally approve of, of Douglas, but we were using the property you were on. We were using it for our farms, and, and you just... It's a wide-open land. Well, that and is it's true. it's going to be American. 
Yes, yes, I can see that it is going to be American. As I say, I am of two minds with this whole thing. I, I do not want the Americans here, but I can see they are coming. And uh, <laughs> Fischette was so funny. <laughs> he said you knocked him right on his keister. I certainly <laughs> did. <laughs> well, man, but I, small woman I like me told take him down. I told him that we might as well give up on you, Mrs. Short, and accept you into the territory. We cannot fight one so uh, courageous as you. Thank you, Mr. That is quite a concession. Yes, you're welcome. The resolution of the conflict between Esther Short and Hudson's Bay Company, she actually regained control of her donation land claim and eventually deeded it to the city of Vancouver. And that's how the city of Vancouver came about, because of Esther Short. So, where are we off to now, Chuck? Well, as you know, the rivers formed the highways of those period of time, and we are now looking through the main north gate, through the south gate, towards the river, where the boats came both downstream and upstream. And we're gonna go there now and take a look at the landing area. Great, okay. Well, here we are on the banks of the Columbia River, and uh, during the fur trader days, the fur traders would bring their long boats down the river to this point. From here back up to Fort Vancouver, it was a clear, open slope about a quarter of a mile away. Beautiful open meadow, lots of livestock out in that area. As the years progressed, ships came in from England up the Columbia River to this point to offload their merchandise for the fort. And it was here too that the first American settlers to go north of the Columbia River started their journey on the Cowlitz Trail. Michael Simmons and his group came west in 1844. The next summer they went north to attempt to get to the Puget Sound country. They were turned back by bad conditions. They again went in July, went all the way to the falls of the Deschutes River at the Puget Sound. They came back to this location where their families were staying. And in October of 1845, they started their monumental trek north to become the first American settlers to form a permanent settlement in the Puget Sound region. So I think from here we want to go look at another of the old living artifacts of that era. A that living it, artifact? A living artifact. It seems to be a contradiction in terms, but it isn't. we will go there now. the approach to the old living artifact. Through this tunnel is an old apple tree that was planted in those early, early times. And I might point out that the railroad now and the highway beyond it are in the area where the open meadows were up to the fort. Well, let's go inside and take a look at the apple tree. This apple tree, as you can see, is still bearing fruit. It was planted by Captain Simpson in 1826, and it is the oldest apple tree in the territory, now the state of Washington. I read about this, and it's talked about how he actually had the seeds in his pocket when he got off the ship and came up here and planted them at the beach west of the fort. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up our visit to Fort Vancouver, at least the Hudson's Bay Company Fort Vancouver. Now we need to go and talk about the military Fort Vancouver. And in the late 1840s, the United States government sent out uh, troops to this area to help protect 
the national interest in the Pacific Northwest. And I think we're next going to go to Officers Row, which was where the American troops were stationed at the time. So off we go again. just left Hudson Bay, Fort Vancouver, and saw all their holdings here on the banks of the Columbia River. Where are we now, Roger? Well, we're at Officer's Row, and only two of the buildings that were uh, are here that were actually standing during the time of the trail. And this house is the Ulysses S. Grant house. Uh, let me just read the plaque. Built of logs as the commanding officer's home and headquarters, the Grant House is the only survivor of the nine log cabins that originally constituted Officer's Row. Brevet Major John S. Hathaway was the first commander at the post. He was succeeded by Brevet Colonel William Wing Loring, later a Confederate and eventually given the title of Pasha for his military work for the King of Egypt. Actually, uh, Grant never lived in this house, but he was an aide to one of the officers that did uh, actually live here and work from here. So he's been in and out, was in and out of this uh, building many times. The other existing building, or building that was here during the trail, is the O.O. O. Howard House, built by General O.O. O. Howard in 1879. It was uh, faithfully restored in 1998 and it's probably a good example of a Victorian architecture that you'll find here. We're now uh, going to go to a place where Esther Short and Amos Short had their land claim and it probably looks very much different than it did then but it's an interesting place to go see and we'll see why in just a minute. We're now at Esther Short Park. This is the oldest public square in the Northwest. It was dedicated in 1855 and was this five acres was part of the original short land claim. Bordering the west side of Esther Short Park is the Slocum House which was constructed in about 1867. Another of the oldest homes in the Vancouver area was a log cabin built by Richard Covington in 1848. Now, although the house has been moved, it's still in its original condition. And we'll go there now and take a look at that. Roger and Karen, come on in. This is the Covington house and the Covington's built this cabin on the 640 acre land claim. They farmed, they taught music to the Hudson Bay people, kids. In the house was a piano. Roger, do you have any idea how old that piano was? I don't know. I know that it did come around the horn. And also we understand that there was a violin and the uh, piano today resides at the Clark County Museum where we're going to visit next. But I want to take you over here to the corner so you can see how the logs are cut to shed the rain. Let's go over there. Okay, you'll see here that it slopes downward from the inside, downward from the inside, so when it rains, the water runs off and out it doesn't flow back into the logs and it decreases the rotting of the timbers. And it would hold together almost as being locked. Yeah, it. But you see this type of corner construction in areas where there's typically lots of rain. Uh, beyond that, uh, they would cut them not 
always sloping to the outside. Historical Museum. I am Susan Tissot, the museum's director. Glad to Glad to have you here today. This is good to see you. Hi, Susan. We've heard that you have a great collection of Indian artifacts and also some other artifacts from the Thai period that we're interested in, and I understand you've brought a lot of neat stuff out for us to look at today. Yes, why don't we go into our main gallery? Okay, I want to take you first into the Native American gallery. If you follow me this way. Um, one of the things that we're most proud of at the Clark County Historical Museum is our Native American basket collection. These are just a few of the pieces in that collection. Uh, something that we've just released this year is a publication called Woven History, and it showcases all 220 baskets in our collection. Uh, this is something that is available through the museum for $24.95 if you're interested. Um, the Clark County Historical Museum has a very broad-based collection that includes uh, artifacts from the prehistoric period all the way through to contemporary folk art. And what I'd like to do now is just introduce you to our collections manager, Eileen Trestane, and have her talk to you about things that are specific to the Cowlitz Trail period. Well, we have some things. As you know, the Hudson's Bay Company was here in Vancouver. Uh, from the early 1800s, and so some of the artifacts that we have from Hudson's Bay Company are the original keys that were given to the museum, and this is a, a jug for um, liquid refreshment for the Hudson's Bay Company people. Uh, in the 1840s, a lot of the people were coming on the Oregon Trail, and uh, one per family that uh, the Hudson's Bay Company and Dr. McLaughlin assisted when they first arrived in 1845, came back in 1847 and were somewhat a thorn in the side of the Hudson's Bay Company, and that was Esther and Amos Short. They uh, homesteaded on property that belonged to the Hudson's Bay Company and uh, put in potato fields where the company was growing wheat, which they didn't appreciate a whole lot, but the Shorts were very persistent. And we have several of their artifacts. Amos drowned in 1853, and Esther Short stayed there, and her land grant became the downtown of Vancouver, Washington, and she gave property for the city park. It was one of the earliest parks on the West Coast. This is her portrait, uh, a very serious looking lady. Uh, she was half Algonquin Indian and half German. And this is a little kerosene stove is what they use to heat the milk for their children to drink. And here we have also their family Bible, which lists the family's uh, birth dates and Esther and Amos's marriage dates, lists all their children, and also lists the date that Amos drowned in the Columbia River. Uh, Esther was also a seamstress of some uh, items and we have her quilt top which is uh, a typical mosaic quilt from the 1840s and 50s. Uh, a lot of the things that they owned uh, were lost when the fort forcibly removed them from their home uh, several times and burned down the cabin that they lived in and put them out to on the river without a paddle and all kinds of things to get rid of them. Uh, one of the times that the fort was sending people to remove them uh, they were warned by a man named Reese Anderson, and that's his portrait here. He uh, also came on the trail uh, and driving cattle uh, across from Missouri to uh, the Dells, and then came on afterwards. He married a lady named Sarah Jane Anderson, and um, in 1851, they purchased fabric from the Hudson's Bay Company store to make her wedding dress. So this is her wedding dress, made in 1851 by her mother. And it is made out of a blue silk plaid uh, in the typical style with the um, gathered front. And then the little silk buttons, most of them have gone but left the pink silk behind. And um, this is the bodice portion. And it was closed with hooks on the back. 
and little brass hooks like this. And then the full skirt is underneath. It was very typical for young women to have a dress that was not white in the 1800s because it wasn't very practical to have a dress that's white you can only wear once. So it would be a print or uh, their best dress that's going to be their Sunday dress, uh, make it useful for a much longer time. She was 13 when she got married to Reese Anderson and he was 29. Anyway, um, Eileen, thank you very much for introducing us to the marvelous collection that you have here. Thank you. Before we go north to the Cowlitz River, we would like to have you show us the piano that was in the Covington house that we were fortunate enough to view earlier. Okay. Um, you might also like to look at the keys over okay. here. Um, the military took over Fort Vancouver, and we have the original guard house keys from the military fort. Here's the Covington piano. It's always on display here at the museum. Uh, this is a picture of what the Covington's cabin looked like right before it was moved into Vancouver. And here it is after its restoration. The Covington's were teachers for the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, they came directly from London and taught there for uh, a short time. And then they moved north of Vancouver and had a cabin. They didn't have any children of their own, but they uh, taught children who came and lived with them. They had quite a house full of children that they taught. We also have the Covington's uh, violin in our collection. Uh, they were very musical and uh, they taught music to all of their students. I understand the violin was uh, actually sat on by Ulysses mm -hmm. S. Grant, is that, is that yes, so? Yes, he was a very sociable gentleman and uh, had to go up the military trail quite frequently. And so it was the stopping place because it took a lot longer to, to travel in those days. So they would go from Vancouver and they would stop on the military trail. It was a very uh, slippery, muddy hill, so it was very difficult for them to get up the hill. Um, he would stop and visit, and <clears throat> while he was entertained at the Covington's home, he uh, mistakenly sat upon their violin. And the violin has been repaired, but we've been told it never sounded quite the same afterwards, but it is part of our collection. Well, we really want to thank both of you, Eileen and Susan, for showing us around today. I wish we could stay longer, but I hope that people really come and to the museum and see all the other wonderful collection and artifacts that you have. And we're going to be heading up the trail now. All right. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming today. Well, Thanks thank a lot. you. Leaving Fort Vancouver, the Hudson Bay fur traders and later the immigrants sailed down the Columbia River past this point on their way to the Cowlitz River. Across the river, which is beyond the island here, is the town of Rainier, Oregon. And quite often the immigrants would sail down to that point, transfer across from Rainier, Oregon to Monticello at the mouth of the Cowlitz River. From that point they would go up the Cowlitz by Indian canoe, by bateau, and later in the eight, late 1850s they would take possibly a steamboat up the river to Cowlitz Landing at today's Toledo. Here we are 27 miles north of Port Vancouver and at the site of present-day Kalama, Washington and in 1853, Ezra Meeker settled here for a short time with his wife, and from here they moved to the Puget Sound area. The marker that we see here was in, erected by the Daughters of the American Revolution in 1916, and it's a third of 13 similar markers between Vancouver and the Puget Sound. Below the Oregon Trail marker, which we 
call for this extension, the Cowlitz Trail, is a marker for Ezra Meeker. And the marker reads, Ezra Meeker, first home site, 1853, 250 feet south, 125 feet east, dedicated August 4th, 1953, 100 years after Ezra and his family lived here. Ezra's house was located across the top of this building here, just this side of the white car on the bluff overlooking the Columbia River. Before we go on to our encounter with the Cowlitz River, we're going to pay a visit to a gentleman who met Ezra Meeker as a young boy in central Washington. This gentleman was born in 1913, 97 years after Ezra Meeker was born. So at the time Ezra visited his school, Ezra was about 90 years old, and this gentleman was 10 years old. But we'll go visit him now and hear about his encounter with Ezra Meeker. Okay, several points along the Callis Trail we've heard the name Ezra Meeker mentioned, and Ezra came west in 1852 to this area of western Washington. He was born in 1830, and he was 22 years old when he came west. He settled in the Puyallup area, and he was quite a traveler. He went to Alaska, he traveled to a lot of places, had a hop farm in the Puyallup Valley. Uh, late in 1906, he went in a re reverse direction on the Oregon Trail to bring the public's attention to the Oregon Trail. And Ezra has a, a real important part in the life of a person that we're going to meet now, Daryl Hedges, who as a little boy in central Washington, growing up, going to school, had a visit from a very famous person one day in about 1920. So with that, I want to introduce Daryl Hedges, and incidentally, Daryl is my cousin. So Daryl, tell us your story about meeting Ezra Meeker. Well, it's sort of an interesting situation. I was uh, a country kid, so to speak, raised on a farm, and went to a country school. And uh, one teacher, eight grades, and somehow, Stemelt Hills School District number 13 was selected as, for a visit by Ezra Meeker. Now it's an isolated area, about 10 miles out of Wenatchee. And uh, there had to be something that enticed uh, Ezra Meeker to make a visit to that small school because uh, probably at the time, there were no more than 12 to 15 students in the school, and that would be one through eighth, eighth grade. Anyhow, we, we knew that he was, we had a little advance information that he was coming, because we were told that he had a half dollar, uh, known in the old days as a four-bit piece, that had been minted as uh, Ezra Meeker half dollar, and they were for sale. Knowing that, I uh, that evening at home, I uh, pleaded for fifty cents so I could buy an Ezra Meeker half dollar. Well, there was a lot of grumbling about that. Half dollars uh, weren't uh, too plentiful in those days with some of us. Anyhow, I prevailed. And on the day that uh, Mr. Meeker appeared, I had my 50 cent piece uh, in hand. Upshot was that we had the opportunity, he came in and <clears throat> talked to the students for a matter of maybe five, seven, eight, ten minutes, something like that, briefly. And he had a wagon a covered wagon, not a Conestoga type, but uh, shaped like one. 
much smaller, and uh, had a span of uh, beautifully masked mules that he was driving on this uh, wagon. So we had the opportunity, uh, the kids had the opportunity to go out uh, in the playground uh, where he had put his mules in the wagon. So we had a chance to take a look at the wagon and its structure and so forth. Now, being a young man at that age, uh, bear in mind, uh, using 1920, I'm uh, uh, not very old and I don't keep very good records at that time. But uh, I'm going to guess it, was, it had to be uh, sometime in 1920 or possibly at 21, but uh, I, I think that would be, time-wise, would be right on target. And that's about the experience I had. Uh, it was a pleasurable thing. I can remember uh, something about his appearance in that he was not a very large man. Uh, uh, he had a, a beard, white beard, and uh, wasn't uh, wasn't very heavy. I'm going to guess probably five, seven, where around maybe five feet, eight and a half, nine inches tall, something of that nature, and not very heavy. Uh, had a uh, pleasant personality. Seemed to enjoy talking to the kids, even though for a short while, where he went to from there or where he came from before. I have no idea, but it was a pleasurable thing uh, with the historical background of having the opportunity to meet him, and see him, and talk with him. Darrell, can you tell us about how you lost your Ezra Meeker and 50 Cent piece? Oh, this, yes, I can, I, I should have mentioned that. I, I treasured that coin, but um, <clears throat> During the following winter, between Christmas and New Year's, uh, my parents' home burned, uh, and I mean it burned to the ground. Uh, it happened, uh, my father and I were out in the shop uh, and uh, getting ready to help a neighbor do something and turned around and steam was pouring out of our uh, upstairs uh, bedroom and because it was the middle of the winter the snow was on the ground and the a uh, deep on the roof uh, covered with snow the only thing that we were able to salvage out of the burning home uh, was uh, my mother's new <laughs> majestic uh, range cook stove and uh, a new Aldrich uh, piano. Those were the only two items that we were able to salvage out of the house. Everything else, uh, Bibles, pictures, uh, any kind of memorabilia as well as furniture at all, everything in the home was gone except those two items. So that's how I lost the coin and uh, along with a lot of other uh, memorabilia items uh, that just plain melted and went out of sight. Uh, never could find them. That's an incredible story, and you know, I think it's a real link between today, 2004, linked to a gentleman who was born in 1830, and you witnessed his visit to your school when he was about the same age that you are now, and I think that's an incredible story. and. We're really thankful that you were willing to put that together for us. Well, it was an experience, and I've been very happy to share what I could with you. Thank you very much, Darrell. Okay, sir. day. How good of you to come to see me. And I understand you want me to tell you a story about how I come to be here. 
and how I cross the Oregon Trail and such. Well, I'm not sure that you have time to hear the whole story, but why don't you come in and join me in, in, in the parlor and let me tell you, a, I'll tell you at least about how I, how I came to be here with the little wife and our son Marion from the village of Portland. That's a story all by itself. Come on and come on and I'll tell you all about it. Brother Oliver had, had found this boarding house in, in, the, in the village of St. Helens and he rented it and what he was doing, you see, he was renting it to, to workers who were building pilings and, and, and wharfs and piers and such because that was going to be the big port on the Columbia River. <laughs> well, I thought, oh, we're going to make our fortune. <laughs> well, that thought didn't last more than a few weeks because the steamship company decided to move its terminal to Portland and all the boarders left and you might say our boarding house business left us. So we, all this time, just a matter of weeks, I've been looking across, across the Columbia River. And there was a site over there that looked attractive. It, it, well, it's, it's where the, the village of Kalama now stands. So we rode over there. It was the latter part of January, 1853. Decided to build a, a cabin there. It, the, the land wasn't, it was rocky, and, and, but we, we'd come to be farmers and that's where we decided to, to stake a claim, at least for the time being. Well, before long we'd built a cabin. We'd planted peas and, 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 and lettuce and onions and such. And, well, by early March, those were starting to come up. We thought, well, this, this country is, is pretty good after all. Well, that's about when we began hearing that they were going to create the territory of Washington. Now it, it, and, and that it would be separate from, from Oregon Territory. And we heard that they were going to construct the capital of the territory up in Puget Sound. Well, that would have left us way down south here, away from where all the people were. And so we decided that maybe we ought to move up north. Now, the little wife had been saving the tiny, cutting the tiny little eyes out of potatoes so we could eat the rest of the potatoes, you see. And uh, we, we planted those little eyes and, well, eventually that crop, which we didn't stick around to, to harvest, was sold for some $4,000. Can you imagine that? That's because potatoes in those days were selling for four cents a pound. Well, come May now, my brother and I decided that we needed to look for a place up north. We started out spent a month, left the little wife in the cabin all by herself. He was a brave, brave soul. And we explored all the way up to Port Townsend and all the way back. Well, you know, we liked the looks of, 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 of Stillicum. Port Stillicum and, and Stillicum City were two rival little cities there side by side. And, well, when my brother and I rode past them, there were seven sailing ships taking on lumber and pilings for San Francisco and places like that. And we thought that might be the place for us to stake a claim. My brother was supposed to have, have arranged for a cabin to be built at the site we had selected. And, well, by a strange bit of coincidence, that site we selected was on McNeil's Island, right where they subsequently built the, the penitentiary. It was very clear that that the little wife needed, needed to rest on, on the journey north on our way up to what turned out to be Stillicum. So I went, I went scouting with the oxen to see if there was any place I could find. John R. Jackson, fine gentleman. Jackson said, well, yes, you may take, he didn't know me, didn't know me at all. Oh, yes, you may take a wagon. You could have two of them if you want, and then just return them when you're done was the kind of pioneer that we, we found all along the trail. At the Chehalis River, I, I, I thought about, about taking out a homestead there in the Chehalis Bottoms right next to George Washington. Oh, you may not know George. Washington is, is, is the founder of, of, of Centerville. Well, you may not know about Centerville either. Well, they've taken to calling it Centralia since then. Oh yeah, fine, fine land, fine man, at Washington. But we, well, we 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 thought about that McNeil Island site, and so that was fine. Well, my father decided he wanted to come out and join us. 
18 and 54, we received a, a, a note, it was three months old, saying, if one of you boys will come back to get us and guide us out there, we're going to join you in, the, in Washington Territory. Well, what to do, what to do? Well, we needed money, and the fellow who'd, who'd bought our potatoes from us, unharvested now, uh, well, we wondered if he'd be able to pay us, and then we thought, no, we, we daren't take a chance on that. We'll just have to, we'll have to earn money. So we moved for a time down to Olympia, worked in the lumber camps there. They were paying $4 a day, $4 for, for chopping shingles as well, $4 a thousand. And we made enough money for my brother to go back to, to the family homestead and, and, and bring the folks out from Indiana. 1862, that's when we decided to come out here to Puyallup. In time, I became a prosperous broker of, of hops. And we went to England four times <laughs> on, on, on one, one of those journeys when Mrs. Meeker met Queen Victoria in 1906. 1906 it was. The hop business had gone astray. I'd lost my fortune. Oh, but I had my health. And that's when I turned to thinking about going back over the Oregon Trail to monument the trail, to get people, to, to stir up the flames of patriotism, to honor those pioneers, so many of whom had laid down forever all along the trail. And that's when I took to returning over the trail with my two oxen. At first it was Twist and Dave. And, and well, the first monument that, that we arranged for, there's the picture of it, dedicating the monument at Tenino, Washington, 1906. The very first one. I was very pleased with those folks who arranged that monument as they did and worked with me on it. You can see that the monument there quarried from stone from, from the, the quarry nearby there. Can't see it for the trees, of course. Well, that was a, almost two years of my life devoted to going over the trail in 1906, and then in 1910 I decided to do it again. But this time, not for monuments, but to more precisely identify where the trail went, including the part of the trail from, from Portland up, up to here in Puget Sound. I mean, people need to be need to be reminded about that trail. They need to know about the heroic sacrifices that were made by all those pioneers. You know, I've survived all these many years now. I'm 96. And, and, and while I think about it, I'm, I'm planning on having a 100th birthday party. And I would like to invite you to, to come and join me at, at this party. And, and, I'm inviting all my friends. The only request I have is that you either pay for your own food or bring your own. But you're most welcome to come. It'll be 100 years in, in four more years, and I hope to see you then. And if you have any questions about my house, you may feel free to ask me and, or, or write me a letter. I'd be happy to reply to you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I, oh, I'm going to go upstairs and, and well, frankly, I'm going to take a nap. From here, we're going to go on north to the Monticello site at what is now called Longview, Washington, to the mouth of the Cowlitz River.